This is the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Hello and welcome again to the Biblical Unitarian Podcast, the podcast that aims to start conversations about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. This is episode number 12. We're going to be looking at the Bible's use of God language for human beings. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. My name is Dustin Smith. I am your host. A casual reader of the Bible will soon come across references where human beings appear to be called God, often without any hesitation or explanation by the biblical authors. Yet, the Bible repeatedly insists that there is only one true God. How are we to make sense of this? So today we're going to be asking, in what manner does the Bible use God language of human beings, and how can this data help us understand the few instances where Jesus is unambiguously called God? So let's begin within the Old Testament, within the Hebrew Bible. First thing we're going to notice is that Moses, functioning as God's spokesman, is called God within the book of Exodus. I'll start here in this first passage. Exodus chapter 4, verses 15 through 16, where God tells Moses, You are to speak to him, to Aaron, and to put the words in his mouth. And I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. And he shall speak for you to the people, and he will be as a mouth to you, and you will be as God to him. That's Exodus chapter 4, verses 15 through 16, where God tells Moses, that Moses will be as God to Aaron. This is God telling Moses that he will be God to Aaron. So God is allowing Moses as God's prophet, as God's spokesperson, to be called God. God here seems to think that that terminology is acceptable and okay. Next passage is in Exodus chapter 7 and verse 1, which says, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you God to Pharaoh. And your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. God here again says that Moses will be God to Pharaoh. This sort of terminology seems to be acceptable. So Moses here very clearly functioning as God's representative, as God's spokesperson, as God's prophet, can rightfully be called God. And the book of Exodus is the very same book where we have one of the Ten Commandments where the one true God says, you shall have no other gods before me. But it seems acceptable through the principle of agency that the one true God can designate human beings to function and represent God in certain capacities. And here Moses is clearly and unambiguously called God, the Hebrew noun Elohim, in two passages. And in the first century, Philo, the uh, Jewish-Greek-speaking exegete, notes and highlights that Moses is called God, and Philo actually brings this point up at multiple times in his writings. So we can see that the understanding of Moses being called God was still understood within the first century AD. Next point we're going to look at is that human judges, those who administer justice on behalf of the one true God, were also often called God. Let's look at this passage, still in the book of Exodus, chapter 21, Verses 5 through 6, where we have this legal code uh, talking and saying that if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out as a free man. Then the master shall bring him to the judge, to God, literally says uh, to Elohim in the Hebrew text. And he shall bring him to the door, or the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an owl, and he shall serve him permanently. This passage here in Exodus 21, verses 5 through 6, calls the human judge God. And some translations will just translate it that the master will bring him to God. But the footnotes usually designate that this is the human judge But here, very clearly, the human judge is called God, is called Elohim, the Hebrew noun for God. Another passage in Exodus, this one in chapter 22, verses 8 through 9, where we see that the human judges are actually called God three times 
within a span of two verses. If the thief is not caught, then the owner of the house shall appear before God, namely the human judges, to determine whether he laid his hands on his neighbor's property. Verse 9, for every breach of trust, whether it is for ox, for donkey, for sheep, for clothing, or for any lost thing about which one says, this is it. The case of both parties shall come before God, namely the judges. He whom the judges, God, condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. And again, in Exodus 22, verses 8 through 9, to where on three occurrences, Elohim, the Hebrew noun for God, is used of human judges. And the NESB actually translates them judges in all three occurrences, but the footnotes tell us that they refer to human judges that are called God. And that makes sense, that judges who are administering justice on behalf of the true God can be called God in a representative sense through the principle of agency. Moving along to the book of Psalms, Psalm 58 and verse 1 begins like this. Do you truly speak righteousness, O gods? Do you judge uprightly, O children of men? So the first verse of this psalm is recording God speaking out to these, uh, these human judges that are called gods. And it makes sense there. The judges there representing God and judging on his behalf uh, can rightfully be called God, although these uh, human judges uh, don't seem to be judging uprightly or speaking righteousness. But they are called gods in this passage. And we have another psalm, Psalm 82, which is uh, short enough to read in its entirety, where uh, human rulers and human judges are called God on two occasions. Start here from verse 1. God takes a stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers, which is really the word gods. He judges in the midst of God. So God here judges in the midst of these human rulers. Verse 2. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Say law. Vindicate the weak and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, and all of you are the sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like mortals and fall like any one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for it is you who possesses the nations. That's Psalm 82, verses 1 through 8. We see there in verse 1 that God takes a stand in the midst of his own congregation, and he judges in the midst of these human rulers. The word there is gods. These uh, human rulers, these human judges are called God there. And also in verse 6, and it's very important that we remember Psalm 82 and verse 6 because we will refer to this later in our study as we reference the New Testament. Psalm 82 and verse 6 where God said that you, these human judges, are called gods. Yet they're going to die like mortals uh, like any of the other ruler, ruling princes. So very clearly there we have uh, four references within the Old Testament, within the Hebrew Bible, where human beings, human judges, are called God. Some of them functioning uh, well, and some of them functioning not so well. The next point in our study, we will note that human kings who ruled on David's throne and exercised the rule of the one true God were sometimes called God. Psalm 45 is a psalm about the wedding procession of the Davidic king. This is about a Davidic king who was married and had daughters. It's likely that this referred to Solomon, although the text doesn't say. But let's look at this passage here in Psalm 45, verses 6 through 7, which states, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of our brightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. Here in this psalm, particularly in verse 6, we have the king called God, and that his rule is supposed to extend for a long time. His throne is to last forever and ever. 
But this person, to not be confused with the one true God, in verse 7, has a God above him. It says, therefore God, your God, has anointed you. So here, within two verses, we have two different persons called God. One of them is the Davidic king, and the other one is the one true God, his God, the God above the Davidic king. And this passage we should also remember because this will be cited in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 1. We will refer to this later. But it's important to note that within the Old Testament, Psalm 45 was referencing a human Davidic king who was rightfully here called God. The next passage we're going to look at is a little more complicated. This is in Isaiah chapter 9 in verse 6, which is often read around the Advent season within Christian circles, the Christmas season, in reference to Jesus Christ. Uh, but we'll have more to say about this here shortly. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Mighty God. This kingly figure here, this royal figure, is actually distinguished from the true God, from Yahweh, in the very next verse, Isaiah 9, 7. But it's clear here that there is some kingly figure here who is called Mighty God. And actually there's four very highly exalted titles given to this king in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. What are we to make of this? Well, it is important to note that this reference in its context referred to the Davidic king during the time that this prophecy was uttered by Isaiah. And this Davidic king was likely actually uh, King Hezekiah. The Hermeneia commentary by Jim Roberts, published just three years ago, says this very thing, that this passage likely refers to King Hezekiah. But one thing is for certain, is that the New Testament never, anywhere, quotes Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 in reference to anybody. So the New Testament never cites Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 in reference to Jesus. And we're seeing that modern commentators are suggesting that this original reference was likely to King Hezekiah. So we're seeing there that we have two references, Psalm 45 and Isaiah chapter 9, where the Davidic king can be called God. And this makes sense because the king who is ruling on God's behalf, particularly on the Davidic throne, can't understandably be called God, albeit on these two occasions. Next thing we're going to note is that God language used in a more descriptive and adjectival manner could be used of mighty persons. So we're seeing here that this God language using the Hebrew nouns El or Elohim, both of the words that are often translated in reference to God, can be used more in an adjectival sense, as in a mighty or powerful. Look at this reference here in Genesis chapter 23, verses 5 through 6 where the sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my lord, you are a mighty prince among us. But the Hebrew there is an Elohim prince, a god prince, a godly prince. But it gets translated as a mighty prince there. So very clearly there, the word for God is used to describe in what sense Abraham is a prince. The translations usually regard it as a descriptive term. He is a mighty prince, as the New American Standard Version translates it. That's Genesis 23, verses 5 through 6. We also see that mighty men in an opposing army to the true God can be called the mighty or the mighty ones. Job chapter 41 and verse 25, it says that when God raises himself up, the mighty fear. And this word for the mighty is Elim, the plural for El, being the Hebrew word for God. But here it's understood as being a descriptive or an adjectival sense. But we have Abraham and these mighty men of an opposing army being called this reference for God, but it's understood here more flexibly in a descriptive or an adjectival sense. But I thought it was important to note these references when we're looking at our study because we're trying to point out how God language is used of human beings. Now that we've surveyed the Old Testament, we can now move on to the New Testament, and we note that the New Testament acknowledges the Old Testament's usage of God terminology for human beings. We will see here in a couple of places that the New Testament agrees with how the Old Testament can sometimes call human beings God. 
and these references to human beings being called God were not misunderstood or felt as a threat to monotheism. So in John chapter 10, Jesus is dialoguing with his opponents, and Jesus says in verse 34, Has it not been written in your law, quote, I said, you are gods? And here Jesus is citing Psalm 82 and verse 6, which we just previously referenced. The passage in John goes on, and Jesus says, If he, this is God, if God called them gods, if God called those human judges gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. And Jesus goes on to explain that if these guys are called gods, then Jesus can certainly be called the Son of God. But Jesus himself quotes a passage that calls human beings God in order to explain how the Father is working in and through his miracles. But we're seeing there that Psalm 82 and verse 6 is cited in the New Testament by none other than Jesus Christ. So he agrees with how the Old Testament can sometimes call human beings God. I think that's very important. Moving along into the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, we'll cite Psalm 45 and verse 6 through 7, which we referenced earlier. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 through 9 says this, But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. So here we're seeing that the New Testament again is citing a reference from the Old Testament to where human beings can be called God, but it should not be confused because it also cites the part of Psalm 45 to where this Davidic king called God has a God above him. And it's very important that it cites that in order to avoid any sort of confusion. There is a human Davidic king called God, but he has a God above him. So that's two references in the New Testament, John chapter 10 and Hebrews chapter 1, where they acknowledge that the Old Testament can sometimes rightfully and authoritatively call human beings God in a representative and agency sense. Our last point, which is the point that we've been aiming at all along, is that the New Testament appears to call Jesus God in a manner that is consistent with the title God being used of authorized human beings. So it appears to me that Jesus is called God, but the best way to understand and to interpret this is in light of all of those references that we saw within the Old Testament and even within the New Testament to where human beings can rightfully be called God as God's representatives and within the principle of agency. Although there are a variety of New Testament passages which are ambiguous, we're not really sure if Jesus called God or if he's distinguished from God, there do seem to be two passages to where it's unambiguous. Jesus is called God. And I will say that this is a rare phenomenon. The New Testament word for God, the Greek noun theos, uh, is used 1,328 times within the New Testament, but I actually think that Jesus is called God twice. So two times out of 1,328 is less than 1%. So this is exceedingly rare and exceedingly uncommon. It is far from the norm. Most of the time, over 99% of the occurrences of God within the New Testament refer to the Father. So in John 20, 28, Thomas calls, note, the resurrected Jesus. This is the resurrected and exalted Jesus, quote, my Lord and my God. And this declaration is surely climactic within the Gospel of John, but the seeds for this high praise of Jesus have already been planted within John's Gospel. And we don't have the time to go through and look at all of these, but I just wanted to point out four of them in particular. In John chapter 1 and verse 18, it states that no one has ever seen God, but Jesus explains and exegetes the Father. So no one has ever seen the Father, but Jesus is the one that shows us and explains and exegetes who the Father is and what the Father is like. Elsewhere in John, in John 14 and verse 9, Jesus says, He who has seen me has seen the Father, because Jesus fully represents the Father 
in every possible way. Someone can look at Jesus and see that God is working in him. And we can see this in our next passage, John 14 and verse 10, where Jesus says, The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Jesus admits that the Father is abiding in him. The Father is abiding in Jesus, doing the works that Jesus is doing. And that's how those who see Jesus can see the Father. And of course, in the context of Thomas's mighty declaration of the resurrected and exalted Jesus being my Lord and my God, is the reference where Jesus says earlier in that passage, in chapter 20 and verse 17, where Jesus is going to ascend to his Father and his God. Jesus still has a God even after his resurrection. So although Jesus appears to be called my Lord and my God, in John 20, 28, Jesus still admits out of his own mouth that he has a God above him. So I think the best way of explaining John 20, 28 is that Jesus is called God here unambiguously, but it's God in the sense that the Father is being represented by Jesus Jesus explains and exegetes the Father. Those who see Jesus can see the Father. The Father is working in and through Jesus. And that we've already seen in multiple occurrences, in multiple situations, that human beings who represent God can be rightfully and authoritatively called God without it being a distraction or deviation from monotheism. And if there's anybody in the New Testament, who represents God. That person is certainly Jesus. There's another reference to where I think that Jesus is called God, and we've already read this reference. This is in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, where it is clear that of the Son, the author of Hebrews calls him God. I'll read that passage again. This is now the third time we've actually read Psalm 45 and verse 6. So here, again, in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, it is citing Psalm 45, verses 6 through 7, to understand something about Jesus. Here's the passage. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Here, the author of Hebrews cites a passage that calls Jesus God, but it makes clear to point out to the reader that Jesus still has a God above him. And he cites a passage out of Psalm 45, which we've already seen that there is a human Davidic king who is called God, but still has a God above him. So, when the author of Hebrews wants to call Jesus God, he doesn't cite a passage in reference to the one true God. No, he cites a passage about a human king called God in a representative sense, but still has a God above him. And I think those are the two references to where Jesus seems to unambiguously be called God. But it seems very clear that those have to be qualified very seriously. The context in both occurrences states that Jesus still has a God above him thus indicating that the God language used of Jesus in the New Testament is similar to what we have observed in other human beings within the Old Testament. So in conclusion, we have observed that, number one, Moses, functioning as God's spokesman, was called God within the Old Testament, and this understanding was still observable within the first century A.D. Number two, we saw that human judges who administered justice on behalf of the one true God, were also called God on occasion. Number three, we observe that human kings who ruled on David's throne and exercised the rule of God were also called God on two occasions. Number four, we saw that God language used in a more descriptive and adjectival manner was used of mighty human beings, and one of those persons was Abraham. Number five, We noted that the New Testament acknowledges the Old Testament's usage of God terminology for human beings. So the New Testament doesn't say that the way the Old Testament uses this language of humans is wrong or incorrect. In fact, it uses that same sort of argument when it wants to call Jesus God. And lastly, number six, 
Although the Bible on rare occasion does indeed call Jesus God, these praises occur after Jesus' exaltation and resurrection and make the most sense when understood in light of other human figures called God as his representatives. And we saw that those human beings functioned as God's prophets, as God's judges, as God's Davidic king. And all three of these, prophet, judge, and Davidic king, apply clearly to Jesus. So if anyone in the New Testament, if any human being has the right to be called God in a representative sense, Jesus is surely that person. Now, if you enjoy the podcast, please consider supporting us as we aim to promote the sound truths of the oneness and unity of God and the humanity of Jesus. If you're listening on YouTube, please consider subscribing and liking and sharing this episode. And if you'd like to offer a donation, you may check out the episode description for a link to PayPal. The Biblical Unitarian Podcast is produced and edited by Dustin Williams. I am Dustin Smith, your host. Until next time, please... Take care.